Welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar, which is entitled Access to Knowledge, a Matter of Equity. My name is Ben White. I am one of the co-founders of Knowledge Rights 21, and I also co-chair with my colleague Barbara Stratton, the Knowledge Rights 21 Policy Committee. Uh, so I'll just start off explaining a little bit about Knowledge Rights 21 for those of you who are not aware of it. We are an Arcadia funded project um, and we focus mainly on uh, digital issues as they affect the research, education and library sector. We are particularly focused on legal change and creating a more supportive legal environment for uh, education and research in Europe. Uh, so that means that we focus particularly on bodies of law such as copyright law, competition law, contract law, uh, contract law in the case of open access and particularly as well as what we have in Europe, which is a growing body of digital platform laws also. In terms of our specific themes, we work on open access in the form of author rights retention and a secondary publishing right ebooks, flexible uh, copyright exceptions, which uh, can also be called open norms, uh, the override of educational um, and research flexibilities in terms of accessing information that comes from contracts and technological protection measures, as well as issues such as um, uh, the European research area, how within the EU, we create um, cross-border cross meaningful uh, collaborations, as well as I said earlier on digital platform laws. Um, we have a, we've commissioned a number of studies. Currently, uh, the only one published is from Spark Europe, and that's entitled Opening Knowledge, Retaining Rights and Open Licensing in Europe 2023 which my colleague will put into the chat so you can find that link uh, easily. That relates to author rights retention. Upcoming, we have a number of reports which are imminent. One is on secondary publishing rights, which creates a right of republication for publicly funded research. One on open copyright flexible norms another on contracts and the extent to which contracts in Europe remove limitations and exceptions in copyright law, as well as uh, also in October, another study on the competition aspects of eBooks. So uh, if you look at our website, you'll see some of the things that we're doing. You will also see uh, a number of videos that we've produced um, and this, this, all our webinars, including this one, will go not only on our website, but on the Knowledge Rights 21 um, YouTube channel. So, uh, so yes, so it, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, as I said, the videos will go on our YouTube channel, and we would ask uh, the questions for the panellists are put in the Q&A. My colleague Stephen from Knowledge, from IFLA and Knowledge Rights 21 will be monitoring the Q&A list. And uh, if you have any burning questions, Stephen might jump in and, and, and ask as, as we're discussing uh, Knowledge Equity Network. Um, but the intention is to have about half an hour to 40 minutes worth of panel discussions before opening that up to questions from uh, the audience. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce my fellow panelists. So first of all is Masoud Korka, who is university librarian and keeper of the Brotherton Collection at the University of Leeds. And he is also currently chair of Research Libraries UK, RLUK, which is a library association of uh, a set of UK universities. Also from Leeds, we have Antonio Martinez Arboleda, who is Professor of Open and Digital Education at Leeds. 
and co-director of the Centre for Digital Research. And last but not least, we have Martin Pronk, who is executive director at the European Research Libraries Association, LIBA. And Martine will is attending today in her personal capacity rather than as representative of LIBA. So I think uh, we have done all the uh, housekeeping. As I said, my colleague Stephen has put into the chat, you can see the report that we issued in June on rights retention and open licensing, as well as the link to our YouTube channel. So uh, with no further ado, uh, today we want, we're not actually going to have any uh, presentations as such in terms of PowerPoint. Uh, so the intention is really just to have a panel discussion. And as I said, any questions, please put in the Q&A. So my first uh, question, I think, you know, uh, aimed probably at Masood, but anyone else, please free feel free to jump in, is could you uh, tell us a little bit more about the initiative, Knowledge Equity Network, it, its background, history, and also a little bit about the declaration itself? Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, firstly, uh, it is so lovely to be here. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to all colleagues who've joined us. And in, I'd like to start by saying in the spirit of knowledge equity, I think it's really critical that we learn from you. So please, if you have any questions or comments, do feel free to add them in the question and answer for that. So uh, Knowledge Equity Network um, came as a desire to really rethink how we work to solve global challenges. We are at a time where we have global challenges that cannot be solved by any single entity, any single organization, any single institution, not even any single country. And these are genuinely global problems ranging from no poverty to all the way to climate crisis, to healthcare crisis, et cetera. And one thing that University of Leeds is really passionate about is, is its impact, it's its global impact. And it was really keen to start thinking about how can it actually really embed that impact across the globe and to bring key partners in that discussion, bring key friends in that discussion who are also thinking of the same thing that we need to work together more. And therefore, if, if colleagues have had a chance to see the website for Knowledge Equity Network, you would have seen the words called radical collaboration. And that is genuinely something that that's needed. Higher education as a system has been very much uh, stuck in its ways of co competition and in many ways unnecessary competition. It's trying to work on ranking space system, which are not really adjudicating the impact that we are creating. It's not really measuring how we are changing the world. And I think it's really critical that we shift that narrative. So Knowledge Equity Network was very much driven by that fundamental principle of we need to work together and we need to work together across the globe. And when we started looking into that, um, it, it started realizing that one of the core fundamental elements in that is not having equitable access to knowledge. And I would go as far as not, not just access, but also not equitable respect or value in different knowledge systems as well. And therefore there was a very clear understanding that for any of these challenges, you need to have a solid knowledge base underneath. And that's why we are really passionate about knowledge equity um, as an underpinning element to all these global challenges and to their resolution. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an initiative that's been driven by our vice chancellor here, Professor Simone Boitendijk, who's the executive lead for that, and uh, also by our deputy vice chancellor, Nick Plant. And together with them, we have now worked with a global set of institutions, organizations, all the way from Wikimedia UK to Coalition S to many, many other universities in there, including University of Pretoria, who's been a co-founding partner in this, Mahidol, Hamburg, Nairobi, many others in, in that regard. 
And together, we are trying to develop this network to start looking at how we embed openness in everything. And openness is the very fundamental step towards knowledge equities. And by openness, we also mean free access in that particular domain. So how do we open up free access to education, to research, but also how do we open up the infrastructures underneath that? In terms of the practicalities of that, it's still a network that's developing. So it's quite early days. Um, however, it's really good to see momentum behind that. So we've got over 140 individual subscribers, over 14 higher education organizations already signed up, over 20 other organizations who signed up, quite a few in the pipeline. And this is all happening even without a public launch of the network. So this is fantastic to see. We're building that momentum and we're hoping that next year we'll do that public launch to bring all of these people together to really start shifting the narrative of higher education as a force for public good. Thank you, Masood. Uh, Antonio, I don't know, do you wish to... Yeah. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Ben, and thank you, everybody, for being here. It's a pleasure to be with uh, Knowledge uh, Rights 21. I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, my, my colleague, uh, Masood, uh, did a very great explanation. So I just want to, to add that the objective of the network is to achieve collaboratively uh, between different institutions, organizations, and professionals of research and education, the objectives of the declaration. That's more or less the relationship between both the declaration that you can sign in our website and the network. At the moment, um, we are programming lots of events. Uh, we think uh, knowledge uh, exchange, raising awareness is fundamental because it's not just about practical um, action, taking practical measures, which we really think is essential, but also to uh, start connecting people and try to build a relationship of trust that will enable us to create a collaboration, effective collaboration, and effective projects to deliver the objectives of the declaration. So it's an ambitious um, ambitious mission, but we, we are confident that we will succeed because we're having great responses and, uh, you know, we, we, we really think that there are a lot of organizations out there who are more or less in the same page. And uh, we're grateful for all the support that we're receiving as well from people like you, Ben. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I guess um, I should sort of un underline that the reason that Knowledge Rights 21, uh, when we, we saw uh, about the Knowledge Equity Network, uh, that we were interested was I guess, uh, a commonality in terms of mission, which is about supporting uh, better means of accessing information, which will underpin innovation and, and collaborations and a, a more open environment. I guess the the difference that, that uh, we observe is that our organization is primarily focused I guess, more on legislative change and regulatory change. So in that sense, we talk about uh, what a lot of what we do is sort of top down because we are aiming at, at the legislature and the regulator to effectuate change, whereas what interested in us and complements what we're doing with the Knowledge Equity Network is, is that it feels like more of a sort of a, a grassroots bottom up approach. So we we talk about the need for top down and bottom up approaches to facilitate more equitable distribution and access to knowledge, which I guess leads on to the question, why is knowledge equity uh, important? Martin, um, yes, maybe, uh, I, yeah. maybe I can take the floor here. Thank you, yeah. Ben, and thank you also uh, from my side for everyone uh, attending this uh, this webinar. Um, I will share uh, my experience from the past nine years, not only from Libra, but also my work at Utrecht University Library in the Open Science Program over there and for the library as um, uh, strategically responsible for developing open access and open open science services. Um, so I, I take this question from a library perspective. 
Uh, and if we're looking at uh, why equity is important, like for centuries, access to knowledge and information and equality of opportunity is really at the core of libraries. Uh, and therefore, open science is also at the heart of libraries. And from that point of view, the output of publicly funded research should be openly available for everyone, both academics and non-academics, because it provides access to scholarship, but also an opportunity to participate in society and fulfillment of potential. Um, now, coming from a library uh, side, um, I would like to make in this webinar an observation because open science for very many uh, good reasons focuses so far primarily on the producer of research output, the researchers. Um, and for that Libra, libraries provide a lot of support, a lot of um, uh, support for researchers make their, their output open or fair, building on infrastructures, working on standards in metadata. So a lot of work has been done and is going on already. But libraries are not only thinking about short-term solutions, they're also in for the long run. So libraries, uh, I think, are anticipating for a time where output in every format, in every form produced today, is not longer directly connected to a researcher as a producer of knowledge. Um, and we still want to be able to use and reuse that knowledge and that output in the future. Um, so what I would like to pose here in this, in this webinar is not only a focus on researchers as producers of knowledge, basically data in every form, but also what I think is important is to make an additional shift uh, and focus also towards the users. Uh, and actually focus on the R uh, in FAIR, the reuse part. Um, and that is for me where equity um, and knowledge should be included as well from a user perspective. And then you get to questions like, well, how easy is it actually to, to find what you're looking for? Or are the tools and systems accessible for everyone who wants to? Um, are you able to value the data you've found or what is needed to select a relevant subset um, who checks actually the purpose of the reuse and do we want to check that? We Many of us may have seen the film Oppenheimer recently. Um, so do we really want to check and control the data that's, that's out there and openly available? And under what conditions are you allowed to reuse the data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So from that much broader point of view, uh, I think it's very important uh, to think on one hand of knowledge equity, but also um, uh, be aware of the consequences. How are we going to implement that? And what does that need from all of us? Antonio, maybe you want to add? Yes. No, I loved what you said, Martin. Thank you. And uh, I totally agree. We need to focus on the user and make sure that the outputs of research are truly shareable, but also that we have uh, a great variety of outputs uh, coming from research, uh, many of them being uh, multimodal, more educational, because when we talk about outputs from research, we tend to think simply about uh, journal articles and books. And we need to understand that everything that we produce in order to help other people's learning is essentially an educational effort. Um, so yeah, that focus on the user, I agree with you, uh, is essential, but that, in, that involves a little bit of a change of, uh, of production culture as well, you know. And um, uh, Ben was asking why knowledge equity now? I mean, the world is in, in real trouble. We need urgent change. Um, you all are aware of the problems that we have with global warming population displacement, uh, water, food availability, education. So our problems are very demanding now. And um, we at universities uh, can promote and pursue knowledge equity, more equitable, more fair access to knowledge production and also to the outputs of research and to education. 
Um, and why, why knowledge equity? Uh, for me, first of all, it's a matter of principle, regardless of any other utilitarian reasons. People have the right to education and knowledge and cultural production. It's a right per se, but also we need to understand that research-based knowledge and education at the end are key to tackle the challenges that we face in humanity. And the more equitable the access and the participation in knowledge construction is, more talent and more diverse talent can be dedicated to contributing globally um, and locally to these solutions. And uh, we are at a, you know, it's, it's an interesting time because we also have a lot of good things happening. Science has advanced very, advanced very rapidly. Digital technology can help us to deliver great architecture for knowledge building and distribution, and also can help us democratize uh, knowledge production. So uh, yeah, we we are we are th at an interesting time, um, and we need to make sure that we make the most of it. Um, but equity is crucial: more openness, participation, less restrictions, uh, and a change of culture as well. I would say. I don't know, Masood. Do you have anything on that you would like to add around why? Uh, knowledge equity, particularly now, is important? Uh, I won't take long on this, but um, it's the way it's the way in which we don't make mistakes. I, I know that sounds a bit direct, but when we do things in our own bubbles, the implementation of that for global outcomes simply does not work. And um, I'll give an example of that from the kind of read and publish model that it's been developed in terms of transformational deals on search outputs. And uh, we had a very uh, inequitable model for um, which is subscriptions based, at least here in the UK and in most of European and wider uh, countries. And what we've done is we shifted that from a subscription based inequity model to a publishing based inequity model. And if we were having those conversations from the very beginning across the globe about how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is consumed, how knowledge is uh, looked at in different cultures, uh, what are the different knowledge systems and how they are uh, supporting each other. I think we would have actually developed a much more uh, reasonable, much more thought through system from the very beginning. So we cannot, because of the urgency of the matters around us, we cannot make mistakes. And the only way to not make those mistakes is by bringing those diverse partners in and say, actually, let's let's work together from the very beginning. That's that's the spirit of radical collaboration that we want to see. Thank you, Masood. Uh I I guess just going back to something that M Martin said about bringing out the R of fair, which is reuse and purpose of use. Um. The last time that I looked for some sort of statistic around what was published open access, which <clears> is <throat> primarily publicly funded research in terms of uh, research, a lot of research coming from research funders, uh, the statistics that I was saying was something about around 25% um, of journal outputs. And again, I, I suspect internationally, uh, Europe will be at the top end of that, uh, just because of the, the the focus a lot of research funders and governments have placed on open access. But of course, publicly funded research is only a subset of the information and knowledge sharing that that we're talking about. Um, and the 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 rest of that, let's say, the majority of information is is subject to intellectual property laws so primarily copyright but also uh in europe database rights and in fact beyond um europe also different differing forms of database rights so it, it seems to me that um you know we can talk about for example digital infrastructures and and that sharing digitally we need platforms and investment in platforms to share knowledge but but we also as martin said is we need to focus i think on reuse and that means focusing on the rights infrastructure to facilitate 
uh, greater equity sharing of knowledge. Um, so that's, I think that's the way my organization would look at these challenges. You know, uh, information is heterogeneous. The thing that does regulate all of this is copyright and other intellectual property laws. Um, and if we're to invest in digital public infrastructures to support equitable sharing of knowledge, we have to have the right rights <laughs> infrastructure in order for for to make that <clears throat> work. Um, Antonio, yeah. perhaps I could yeah. sort of pick on you as it were to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, to ask the question, you know, for you, what does this is that's what a sustainable ecosystem for knowledge equity means to me. Yeah. Um, as an outsider, I'm interested in what it yeah. means for, for, for you and the initiative. Yeah. Well, for me, uh, actually, I'm going to speak <laughs> first of all in a personal capacity with uh, you know my my view uh, on the knowledge publication system and the knowledge production system because. I take the point that you make about knowledge rights being fundamental, but we need to, I think we need to get the right context about what's the role of regulation within the system, you know, of knowledge production and particularly knowledge publication system. And if I may, I like to use an analogy, yeah? So I like to propose that, that we all think about the knowledge publication system as a big piece of equipment, a big machine made of metal and plastic, where the knowledge producer pours the knowledge through a, a funnel or, or a feeder. And then, uh, for instance, you pour into the, the machine uh, an article or a submission to a journal. And then at the end of the machine, there is a sort of conveyor, a conveyor belt that delivers the published output. And that machine, the publication machine, has a lot of components little engines, levers, levers and pipes, slots, etc. Yeah, so I want you to picture that, yeah? So um, the machine. So in the 20th century, a bit of history for uh, people who are younger, um, in the 20th century, the machine uh, was relatively simple because all the outputs were printed on paper, either on, you know, for a journal, articles, uh, paper, journal, books, conference proceedings, everything came out with a price tag, uh, the submission, and uh, you needed to subscribe to the print journal, for instance. And it was relatively system, but with the arrival of the internet and also digital tool uh, for, for production, the technological possibilities changed radically. So a new paradigm, economic and technological, transformed the publication and distribution of knowledge. And this new technology was promising great affordances, better ways to reach out with knowledge and ambition of openness. Uh, in theory, it would allow for lower costs uh, of uh, the publication process. But the problem is that the machine, the publication system, had been originally built under the old paradigm of the print. At the end of the 20th century, it became clear that the intellectual property system was not really fit for purpose because you cannot control effectively digital intellectual property with the same laws and mechanisms applied to the intellectual property for paper. So what did happen with the digital turn? Well, it, for the old machine, it meant that lots of new different components eh, for parts for the machine had to be added um, to accommodate for the greater variety of uh, digital outputs, not just paper, new levers, new controls, greater level of complexity, different options for paying a slot to pay a source, to pay before dispatching, uh, if you want. If you want to publish totally open, then your organization has to pay for the article. And there was a lot of great professional effort in making this machine very sleek and effective, and the machine continues to serve a great purpose. I'm not denying the need to have a publication system, yeah? I don't want to belittle the work of uh, the engineers and the operators, but the machine, this publishing machine, has not delivered as much as expected. There are plenty of paywalls uh, in many cases. Uh, universities have to pay for open access. Uh, not everybody who is actually in a position to produce quality outputs can access the system because of economic barriers and cultural barriers. So how do we fix this? Yeah. 
Is it about gaining control of the mechanisms of the machine? Do we coordinate ourselves uh, to have a greater input in how the machine works? This is difficult. Not impossible, but it's difficult because it is not our machine. You know, the machine is owned by other people. Is it about a state regulation of the machine? And this is where the, the, the comment about regulation comes. So pricing systems or new specifications for how the machine works. Secondary publishing rights, I think it, that's a very important part. Yes, of course. But the, there is a problem is that the more, the greater the conflict of interest or the divergence in mission, yeah, in the different parties involved in all these processes, the harshest and the stronger have, the, the regulation has to be. You know, that is a, a problem with the regulation when you have different people involved in all these processes of knowledge production and dissemination with divergent interests, economic, etc. Then regulation um, can be problematic. You need more regulation, you need harsher regulation, and that can affect in many ways the way in which people work, the feasibility of the machine itself. Do we ditch another option? Do we ditch the machine and stop feeding it? No, that's not an option. The machine cannot actually stop. Radical change can lead to chaos or disaster. The knowledge needs to keep flowing. We need science and education. So is it about perhaps improving radically what we do outside the machine in the pre-production stage? Yeah, what we do before we put the knowledge into the machine and what we do after the publication, yeah, which is what Martin was talking about. Once the assets are there, that is very important. But for me, the most important of everything is that we take agency, knowledge producers, people working in institutions, we take agency, look at the old machine, step out uh, for a few minutes, consider what changes are needed, and perhaps start considering, uh, and many people are doing that already, building new machines. Mm -hmm. Machines that are built to deliver simplicity, that can start competing with the old machines, that can attract more knowledge producers, uh, deliver more knowledge quality, encourage new business models, encourage investment, public investment. And there are a lot of initiatives, very good initiatives on this area. So with this, we need those alternatives, more new machines that we can have better control of, that can offer better deals uh, for the knowledge producers and for the institutions and for the people. So in that, context, regulation mm, will be more effective because regulation will uh, deal with relationships that are less confrontational, relationships where there is a more, greater convergence of aim. You know, when you have people working cooperatively, um, looking at the changes needed, and they are aligned mm, in interest with the purpose of the institutions and the greater good, you know, regulation is relatively effective and easy to produce, yeah? So I, I would say that that is something that has to happen for regulation to be uh, more effective and easier to, to actually uh, develop and propose and get approved. Thank, thank you, Antonio. So just turning to Masood, so Antonio says we shouldn't ditch the machines, we should have competitive new machines. How 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 do you think that we make equitable distribution of knowledge sort of more sustainable or sustainable? And, and what does that look like? Yeah, I, I must admit, when Antonio was giving that analogy, I don't know whether people are familiar with Studio Ghibli movies, but How's Moving Castle was in, coming in my mind with all the different components and everything going through. Um, I think fundamentally, we haven't actually used the digital technologies in the way to disrupt the environment. So if you, even if you go all the way back to the formation of the internet, the whole idea of the formation of the internet was to democratize um, the, the right to have access to knowledge from the very beginning. And yet it hasn't actually done what it was supposed to do. And I think now is the time for us to firstly acknowledge that we are trapped in that big machinery. There's a whole ecosystem here, which is being driven by a few parties, more towards them, publishers, vendors, et cetera. And, and if you look at this as a business model, and I, I don't know how else to describe this, 
it's an amazing business model for, for key publishers because there's free labor from all the academics, mostly free labor from every professional services staff who's working to support that system. And yet they are gaining all the real benefits out of that machinery in terms of, in terms of profits and prestige. I think we need to really start shifting the, the narrative around this. We need to start thinking of other models and we need to start using technologies and infrastructures to do so. Now is the time to do investments if, as libraries or as higher education organizations or as funders or as uh, bodies who support openness. I think we need to come together and we need to start saying, what are the other funding models or what are the other models of research production, knowledge production that we're going to invest in? And we don't have the final answer. We don't know how we're going to shift the whole landscape. But unless we do that experimentation and investment, no model will ever replicate this machinery. So I think firstly, we need to think about distributed models of investment. And secondly, we have to admit that even those who are benefiting the most from the existing model, whether they are rich publishers or extremely privileged higher education institutions, we have to work with them. And this is a cultural shift problem as well. This is not just a, a knowledge production problem. And these things often take a very long time, but it's that coordinated effort, which is what Knowledge Equity Network is trying to do. Instead of Leeds doing this or Hamburg doing this or Nairobi doing this or some other place doing this on their own, we bring that collective pressure. And that collective pressure could be our own practices to begin with, but also lobbying, also convening, also bringing funders on board and really start changing the narrative about this cannot be a sustainable, equitable model for future. We are not producing the right impact that you are funding that research or education for, and we have to change this. Hmm. And I don't have the answer, but I would be extremely thrilled if someone can share their ideas on that. What, what can we do? Is, it, is Diamond Open Access Publishing the right answer? Is community-based open access publishing the right answer? Is it a hybrid model? What, what do people think? I would be really keen to hear your views. Martin. Yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, thank you both for for your sharing your thoughts. I would like to add and uh, um, and follow up on on what Masood and Antonio are telling the machine and and what are the right answers. One of the things that comes in mind, as long as we take, um, well, for me, open science, like like I said, uh, is very much um, aimed at the producers of of knowledge, and it seems that we when we've reached all output to be open, shared or fair shared, that we've reached our goal. Uh, but wasn't it really that the goal was that we have all that knowledge available? So basically that's one step further than, um, than just sharing it openly or fair. It needs to be out there to be used by others. And, um, and, and what resonates really um, uh, from the, the knowledge equity declaration is uh, the shift from uh, competition to collaboration. And also when you, you know, the, the Western or the, what I know from the European side and all the transformative agreements and all the, the models that we have here for, uh, for publishing is, is still very much driven by uh, careers and business models instead of shouldn't we just share that what we're producing under a, a, a public funding because we that's that's what we're here for others should be able to use uh, the knowledge that we're producing in the academic world or research under public regimes uh, and then you take then then your goal is one step further down the road than only uh, producing open or fair output and I well personally I think that could be a shift in also looking at what kind of solutions are there because you need to think a bit further than just the machine Antonio that you're uh, 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 describing because a machine is in a factory and basically when all the produced goods stay in the factory nobody uses them so you need something outside the factory that's actually there to uh, distribute it or making it interesting for people to use it or to buy it or to to gain it 
and, and do something with it. So my pledge would really be whatever machines we build, also make sure that the next step is taken and then it, that it can be used and that we think about uh, frameworks, whether it be legal or policy-wise or interoperability or uh, the support systems that we need to actually uh, make sure that people can use um, uh, the knowledge that, that is produced, uh, that should be also uh, in focus of mm. a good solution. Absolutely, yes. So just before we open it up to the floor, just very, very quickly. So we, we, have, a, we have a vision, which we've discussed. What practical steps can individuals and organizations take to make uh, better equitable sharing of knowledge a reality? So just very, very quickly, um, bullet point style, what, what practical steps can people and organizations do? I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I think firstly, thank you for being here. You've already taken step number one. Uh, step number two is uh, if you are uh, keen on this um, equitable concept, please join the network. Please join it as an individual. Please encourage your organization to sign up. I think that would be really important. Uh, third bullet point, read knowledge equity declaration. I think that's a really, really key message on how we want to shift the culture, but also the practices that are currently feeding the machine and how we can actually develop new machines. And last but not least, uh, attend our events, be part of the discussion, Have a bring your own thoughts, uh, bring others into this debate. I think that is really important because without that, we cannot move forward. This has to be an equitable, collaborative effort. Thank you, Masud. So, um, Stephen, if if there are some um, great questions that I miss, please please shout, please shout out. I'll I'd like to start with two questions. I think which I will do separately because they're quite meaty questions so the first question that i'd like to ask is is a mishmash of a comment from richard poinder and um a question from ross mounts so the oa movement was envisaged as a distributed community but when it failed that when it failed it changed to to one funded by governments and research funders and I, I suppose implicitly what we see there is sort of the gap that was opened up in universities and amongst researchers themselves, um, funding organisations had, had to step in. So Ross Mounts asks, who is going to change the culture at particularly elite research intensive universities, such as Harvard, Yale, Cambridge and Oxford? Um, don't they have an incentive to keep the status quo? How will this initiative change the thinking at the, the elite universities? And I think, again, implicitly there, we there is a sort of a, a trickle down effect by focusing on those universities. We may, through the trickle down effect, effectuate systemic change. I think I'll, I'll take one part of this, which is uh, the elite universities part, and then others can absolutely add. Um, my personal view on this is uh, we we don't focus on the elite universities to begin with. I think one of the most interesting thing about leads is that we are a world top 100 institution and yet we are talking about this, that we don't believe in rankings and that we need to move away from rankings as a core criteria to more collaborative impact as a core criteria. And if we can do that, hopefully others will recognize that and acknowledge that and realize that higher education is here for a purpose. And that purpose is not to compete with each other. That purpose is to generate impact for public good. Um, what I would also say is that this is both a movement and a, and, a, and a plea. And for those who've been part of the open access movement for a long period of time, actually, one, one would recognize that there have been ups and downs in that movement, but when the mandates came in, it generated pressure. Now, whether the pressure has generated in the right outcomes or not is a, is a separate question, but it did put pressure. 
And I think one of our aims now is to really work with the promoters of this, those who are partners in this, and actually use them to start building momentum and pressure. The more we can do, the more organizations that can join, the more individuals that can join, the more conviction we have in this, and the more those organizations will have to listen to the changing paradigm around this. So yeah, it's a long-term process. It's not going to immediately shift everyone's mindsets. But if we don't do this now, I think we are looking at something that's never going to change, and that would be a real shame. Thank you. Does anyone else want to? Yeah, I, I totally jump agree. On, jump, jump in, yeah. jump on elite universities. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. One of the my firm convictions is that we are in the right side. Okay, so uh, the the machine is not working. A lot of our colleagues and a lot of our leaders at different levels agree that we need to do something about this and um, change is coming. Uh, I'm very important, Ben, you mentioned at the beginning that we were grassroots where you were operating at top down level. Uh, we have leadership as well involved because the Knowledge Equity Network is made up of institutions and professionals, individuals, and we have institutions who are signatories to the declaration. When there is an institution that is part of the network, they are signing the declaration. They are committing institutionally to those to those objectives. So we are we are not just a group of individuals who try to create somehow a change of mind or promote a cause. You know, we we have uh, also the support of the leaders of the institutions. Uh, involved, and that's why we we want to encourage people here attending today this seminar to you know um, tell in the institution how important knowledge equity is, and uh, you know explain to people how the institution could be involved. And there are a lot of great institutions and institutions all over the world who share our goals. It's just that you know we need to uh, give them time to realize uh, what this direction of travel is. Thank you. Um, I just sort of making a question from one of the observations that that, that uh, interested me. So, as I said at, at the beginning, it, it still feels to me that a lot of this conversation is in and around academic publishing, which, of course, is just a subset of um, all the information that students, researchers will 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 use. And 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 therefore the 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 funding models will and changing funding and discussions around funding will only change. Uh, I think that subset of knowledge which which is is currently represented largely by academic publishing. Even that, I think the open access movement, as Caroline Ball from the ebook SOS um, campaign says, has been very much focused really on the postgraduate level, the researcher level. Um, and uh, because it's focused on journals, um, you know, at the undergraduate level, undergraduates primarily use books, which, um, you know, ha has not had the focus and the funding that that, that journal op oriented open access investments have had. Um, so focusing on that subset of, of research publications, um, Richard Poinder says that, you know, funding for this, and I would say subset of, of, of important, very important um, forms of publication is, is required. Um, Lieber, in terms of its uh, model law for secondary publishing rights, which just to remind everyone is a model law which uh, promotes that the fruits of publicly funded research are, are made immediately uh, publicly available at the same time that uh, the proprietary publisher um, also <laughs> makes it available. And what we did in 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 that is is redefine the definition or the European definition, let's call it, um, of of publicly funded. And what we did there was was say that publicly funding should be defined as not only funding from research funders, but also um, employers in terms of the university. So, so um, 
and I th and I think certainly under the next commission and the next parliament, secondary publishing rights has clear um, pathway, shall I say, to to European level legislation. I think you know that's one of the questions that we have to surface. What is the definition of publicly funding? Should it not have a more expansive de definition? Um, so that's that is uh, one idea for um, picking up on Richard's point about focusing on on funding as being a key issue. I just want again just opening it up to the panel. What what other um, areas of uh, in and around funding do you think uh, the 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 campaign should focus on, promote, discuss? So I'll, I can give a library funding perspective as, as the university library and I do have control over some funding. Um, I think firstly, when you think about this globally, it's quite difficult to define a model of what's public funding and what's not because higher education institutions or other organizations are funded in many different ways across the globe. So the funding models in UK are going to be very different to funding models in US and, and in Canada or in, in South Africa and other places. So we need to respect and acknowledge that, that uh, no single definition will apply globally. However, um, one thing that we are actively looking at um, in Leeds, but also within the N8 universities, which is the North N8 research intensive universities in the North of England, is whether we can commit to shifting a proportion of our um, budget spent on the existing models to more open models. And we recognize that we can't do that overnight. None of these changes are going to happen overnight, but maybe in the next three to four years, can we shift 25% to 30% of our budgets to be dedicated to open publishing, whether that's open access research publishing, whether that's education publishing, whether that's investment in open infrastructures, that's absolutely something we can do more of, but at least at a broad level, we have to commit. And that's what we are actively looking at at the moment. Thank you. Um, I don't, Antonio, Martin, don't know if you want to comment on funding. Well, one of the interesting uh, things, if I may add, um, uh, if you're going to uh, shift um, uh, budgets towards um, uh, open access initiatives uh, in a broad sense, um, I, I think it's really good to, which I, I totally second, uh, that, that I think there needs to be a shift uh, uh, because any any um, initiative that you take will cost money. So we need to we need to find a way to actually finance um, uh, this, the, the new system, the new machines, like Antonio is calling them. Um, but it also means that you need to uh, rethink the way uh, the money is distributed and the consequences of that. Um, institutes are very risk avoiding uh, organizations. So in the end, they do not want to give a blank sh uh, check to uh, to their researchers and say that, well, do whatever you want. We trust you, everything will be all right. Um, the current system actually has limits and has boundaries by which institutes, uh, governments are secured by, okay, this is how much it costs and this is what we get for that. So it's also rethinking what do we need in a new system if we shift money um, uh, towards initiatives uh, that support open access publishing in whatever way uh, we want to. And I think that's a multifaceted way, different uh, tracks uh, or different ways uh, along each other, not just one solution. It's also good to, to uh, think about um, what researchers can do to actually, in the beginning already of their, their research, uh, how would you like to publish? So uh, think about a publishing strategy that is easier to uh, allocate money to in the end uh, uh, if you want to uh, publish your, your output openly or fair. Um, so, so we need more security, I think, from 
from also the 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 publishers of of Nexus where we want where do we want to publish how much is it going to cost because otherwise we 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 uh, walk into the same trap it's going to cost a lot of money if if there's no limits and no boundaries on this um yeah so that's that's one of the if, thoughts that i have in shifting yeah. that perspective or that that money from reading to apcs to actually a more open model yeah if i may add thank you martin that's uh, great and if i may add as well that uh, one of the key points of the knowledge equity declaration is reward and recognition of open practice so we are going to look at that very important aspect of the knowledge production system because we need to encourage professionals to take up open practices um, and uh, there is no better way than rewarding and recognizing openness and of course with uh, alternative systems education let's say cooperative system or mutualist systems um, we can introduce um, uh, different ways of uh, recognizing that effort as well. Uh, and it's very important that we think that at the moment, currently, we and that's going to be the case for the next decades, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of universities, higher education institutions, all of us uh, trying to build our repositories, all of us trying to um, take our initiatives, which is great, uh, but we need far more collaboration because we need to pull resources. And, uh, in, you know, that's very much related to the funding, you know, the funding that universities receive for the research. Some of that has to be channeled and is being channeled into infrastructure and better practices, but, you know, with a greater um, global outlook uh, for more collaborative partnerships and not simply on initiatives that are focused exclusively in our own institutions. Um, Justin, I will ask one final question, um, even though we've we've hit hit the hour, um, just because it's 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 a, a very interesting question, I think quite close to, to um my my heart from Jose Guzman. Um so I, I guess at the beginning, when I talk about or when we talk about top down as opposed to bottom up, we view the open access movement uh, uh, as sort of universities funders using their own resources um, in order to change the academic publishing system for, for the benefit of, of <laughs> all. Um, but once you step outside those spheres of influence, outside the ivory towers as it were um that hits the reality of larger investment frameworks legal frameworks um and therefore just picking up on what jose said which is how do you envis envisage the impact of the knowledge equity network on public policy on those private you know the mass of of private investment in data, the internet platforms. You know, what what do you think the wider impact of this will be outside of universities? Yeah, I think I think we 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 want radical collaboration, but we are mindful that uh, change, you know, takes time, and uh, this is about disrupting, but at the same time, uh, it's very much about engaging. Yeah, and as I said before, the knowledge production machine and the knowledge publication system, they need to keep working. We need education, we need to research. Um, I envisage, uh, I like to think, uh, a change of business model and a change of uh, uh, the way in which um, these organizations work as they realize that there are new cooperative competitors who are actually delivering quality for the greater public and for the uh, people who work producing that knowledge and the uses of knowledge. I, I think that is the way forward. And we have great professionals working in the in that sector who will be joining us at some point, will be joining these new initiatives um, because, uh, you know, they will be presented with that opportunity and we need the expertise and, you know, the, what they have learned in their own 
this is in their own employers. So it it is uh, it is about change, eh? but bearing in mind that we need to keep um, knowledge uh, being produced and we need to keep education going. Just very quickly, very, very quickly. I think if we can generate local public impact and add global public impact at the same time, that's a win-win situation. I think that, that will appeal to any funder. And I also strongly believe that we will need to do ethical industry partnerships in this. We, we shouldn't be doing this on, on our own. We should be bringing other partners in this because that's the only way to disrupt that and on, to think differently. And it's a, such a shame because there's some really good questions on AI that, that also generate that kind of real thinking about what's the, the knowledge, truth in the future, how do we develop partnerships around that, et cetera, et cetera. But happily, very happy to take them off off chat at some other point. Okay, so yeah, we're 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 past the hour now, and I could see the participant numbers dropping. So, um, just re re just to remind everyone, we've put in the chat. Please look at the Knowledge Equity Network um, declaration. Please sign as an individual i think you can sign as an individual you can sign as a non-academic institution but also as a university you can you can sign so please uh look at that um as i said at the beginning a couple of times we'll put this up on uh the our youtube channel um and i guess just to finish finish off um i'd like to thank Masoud, Antonio and Martin very, very much for um, preparing today um, and, you know, suggesting, guiding how we might take this, this forward. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you, of course, very much to all the participants and the interesting questions that we received. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.